Anyway, speaking of fart streams, uh, here's Piers Morgan. Maria Hassan is a broadcaster with a big bite. His MSNBC show was abruptly cancelled at the end of last year, but not before his criticism of Israel's war in Gaza had sparked plaudits and protests around the world. He's best known for his tongue-lashing monologues and probing interviews, which have made him a big hit online. No, Piers Morgan is too old to know what tongue-lashing and probing would, would indicate. There are also people no. that your government has no. killed. You accept that, right? You've killed children, or do you deny no, that? No, I do not. I do not. December. Yes, you did, Vivek. This, is, this is awkward for you, because you me, did. I've got the tax returns in front no, of my it's face. Not awkward. And the former president of the United States today threatened America's Jews. Do you believe that if elections are held on time in October of this year, that your besieged party can still win and that you can still be prime minister again? Surely that's a pipe dream now. I, I think it was not core to communism, no. So when Karl Marx was talking about religion being the opiate of the masses, that was just a throwaway line. God, Mehdi Hassan is great at this. There's no contradiction between those two statements. Well, now Mehdi's joined the US Guardian, using his first column to call Israel's offensive a genocide. Also started his own media company, Sateo News. His New York Times bestseller, Win Every Argument, was known to be written before he'd appeared on this show. And now Mehdi Hassan is uncensored. Mehdi, how are you? I'm good. Thank you for that introduction, Piers. <laughs> we've, we've had a few ding-dongs on, uh, on X, formerly Twitter, over the years. What? We've had a few ding-dongs? Okay, chat, have any of you ever heard ding-dongs used in this way? We had a we had a few ding dongs over on on X. Like, I've I I've never heard that in my life. Usually, if somebody in America, usually if somebody's talking about a ding dong, they're talking about a very stupid person. Oh yeah, that ding dong over there, you know. Or like Piers Morgan is a ding dong, you know. We, usually, it would be like that, you know. I don't know. Piers Morgan was also talking the, talking about tongue lashings and probings and ding dongs. You know, I don't know. There's a, there's a what what webs we weave, huh? Is uh, recently I've noticed a pattern where you've started a few tweets saying, "I hate to admit this, but I agree with Piers Morgan." Yeah, you've said some sensible things about the conflict in the Middle East. You've said some sensible things about Islamophobia. I feel like you've matured over the years. <laughs> Uh, I'd be following what's happening. I, I don't think Mehdi Hassan was joking. Like, Piers Morgan has gotten a little better on some issues. With you with great interest. And as somebody who was at CNN and left, left there pretty abruptly myself a few years ago after a, a series of very uh, lively debates with members of the NRA about gun rights in America, you know, I, I could see what happened with you. And we'll come to that a little later. But first of all, how are you enjoying the freedom of your new life. <laughs> Very much so. Um, I'm someone, as you said, who likes to speak out. Uh, I'm known for speaking very freely. And look, it's great to have your own enterprise, start your own media company. I'm 44 years old. I've worked for the BBC, for Sky, for Al Jazeera English, for NBC, for HuffPost. Uh, and it's good to actually be my own boss for a little while and to be able to, especially at a time, Piers, when the world is going through so much. You have the, the war in Gaza, you have an election in the US, you have the rise of fascism globally. It's a lot I want to speak about. About both see th th this is why i like Mehdi hassan like he he's he's a straight shooter okay he's a straight shooter he like he calls it he, he calls the rise of fascism i feel like at this point in the mainstream media like my bar is so low that like Mehdi hassan easily clearing it is is a breath of fresh air you know both online and in my shows and in my writing and, you know, it is good to be uncensored, including on this show. It certainly is. It's great to have you. Um, let me just take you back to October the 7th. I want you to imagine, and it's a bit of a leap, I, I admit, but I want you to imagine that you are the Prime Minister of Israel when that atrocity happens in Israel. What do you do? That's a great question. So short <laughs> answer is I resign. 
because I'm the responsible for that attack. I'm the one who botched security at the border. I'm the one who propped up Hamas with money from Qatar over the years. Nailing the points. Nailing the points. Let's go. Years and allowed them to be propped up as a way to divide the Palestinian people. I'm the one who's had millions of my own people on the streets for months protesting against my authoritarian reforms to the judiciary. So I have some shame. I have some self-respect. I have some honesty. And I say, I quit. Let someone else do this because I've failed for 20 years. OK, Netanyahu did not do that. And interestingly, although the majority of Israelis would like him to go, hey, Kevin they Blaise. also want him to finish the job in destroying Hamas. There's, yep. there's not much ambiguity in terms of how Israelis feel about the, the mission plan. Um, but there's obviously a lot of concern mounting around the world about the scale of Israel's response. And that's really what I, I guess my, my question was alluding to. Yes. I, I'll be honest, I've said this a lot on my, on my Uncensored show, that I felt a real moral quandary. You know, I can go back over tweets I've done back in 2014, where I said that Israel's response to uh, provocation by uh, Palestinians at the time was bordering on terrorism. You know, I have somebody who, when I was editor of the Daily Mirror, opposed the Iraq war before, during and after very vociferously. And I think that aged pretty well, that campaign. Um, I'm somebody that when the Qatar World Cup happened, you know, I sprang to defense of Qatar's right to host the World Cup and exposed a lot of Western hypocrisy. And yet when it comes to this yes. particular conflict, I, I feel genuinely conflicted, for want of a better phrase. And, and the... It, it's so weird because he'll have... I, I, I feel like he's been playing this I'm conflicted card for months now. And it's just like... He'll have on, he'll just play devil's advocate against whoever he has on. I don't, I don't think he actually has a position on this. And that that's what's frustrating about it, because he'll have on, like, someone like Rabbi Shmuley, who's who's there to just say, like, oh, let, let's kill all the Palestinians, Piers. It's, it's the easiest thing, Piers. And Piers Morgan will be like, whoa, 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 I don't support killing all the Palestinians. And then he'll have on someone who's, like, pro-Palestinian be like, do you condemn Hamas? You know, like there's there's no there's no actual position here, which is what confuses me. I think. Pierce keeps his mask on. Yeah, that's the thing. I I want to know what his actual position is, just just because I'm curious at this point. You know. The point of my conflict is so, this: really, is that the reason I asked you that question about if you were the prime minister of Israel, it's very very difficult to know how any prime minister of Israel could have responded in a particularly different manner to the way that Netanyahu did. Putting aside all the reasons that you say he should have resigned, and by the way, I broadly agree with them. So, um, in terms of the Israel people, the prime minister at the time, the response to what happened that day was going to always have to be enormous, wasn't it? So you're right in terms of the emotional response. It was going to be enormous. And I would take us back to 9-11, Piers. You mentioned Iraq. Mm. After 9-11, there was an emotional response in the US that something had to be done, right? There's, you know, there's the famous yes minister dialogue. Something has to be done. This is something. Let's do it. And we invaded Afghanistan, which didn't solve the problem of terrorism, made it worse, punished innocent people who had nothing to do with 9-11. And you'll remember at the time, Piers, both parties in the United States supported going into Afghanistan. Only one member of Congress, not Bernie Sanders, Barbara Lee of California, voted to oppose that war. Two decades on, many people would say she was vindicated, even though she was an isolated voice, and she was going against a tidal wave of opinion from liberals and conservatives said, we have to do something. And I get that. After an atrocity happens, people want to do something. But the best leaders, the most strategic leaders, the most moral leaders are the ones who can take a pause, take a breath, and say, are we going to make the situation better or worse? Are we striking out strategically or just for the sake of vengeance and revenge? And you talk about Israel... Well, the, and the best leaders don't just lead their people off a cliff into like a uh, a geopolitical abyss you know if, if like if you how do i how do i even put this right if you genuinely want the best for the state of israel the, the state like the state of israel you do not want them to actually wipe out all of the Palestinians. Because at that point, like, the world turns against you. There are, there are very few red lines, but if you wipe out, like, all of the people that, like, in the international community for months 
has been saying, don't don't you kill those people. Don't you kill those people. Don't you kill those people. And then you finally do it. You become an international pariah. You know, like there there are long term consequences from that on an international stage. And especially on a regional stage, even. Um, well, and that's the thing for Lorne. There, there's no motivation for, for Benjamin Netanyahu to end the conflict, because if he ends the conflict, he's out of power, and then he's going to be prosecuted for crimes. Uh, because, uh, lest we forget, he what is almost assuredly guilty of like a wide variety of fraud crimes for which he was about to be prosecuted prior to October 7th. And uh, on top of that, he's a fascist. Like, he has a personal motivation, but he's also ideologically a fascist. He's aligned with the settler colonialism, and frankly... Even if you pointed out to him that th that this is not that, that this is going to destroy Israel on an international stage, he would he would say, "Then that is a price we are willing to pay." He is part of a death cult. Fascism as a core component is a motivation to die. You know, it, it's like what the cult of heroism instills on uh, small fascists before they get old enough to go to war. You know, you, you instill in them this cultic heroism whereby the highest form of service to one's neighbors is to die in service of the state, you know? And fascism as an ideology, well, that's what's leading him to, to this point. And that's kind of, I, I wish that would have been brought up here because... I think it's such a core component of understanding this situation. I think that you are woefully unequipped to understand Israel-Palestine right now if you aren't even willing to acknowledge that Benjamin Netanyahu and Likud are, are fascist. Uh, someone explain what death cult actually means. So um, one of the core components of fascism is basically... Um, a, a veneration of death in specific circumstances. So, uh, for example, dying in a cell because you're, you're protesting for peace with a hunger strike that in, according to a fascist cult, that's, that's, you know, that's not masculine. That's not patriotic. That's not acceptable. You know, there's no honor in that, uh, dying on the battlefield to subjugate, uh, you know, the, the, the colonies or what have you, that is honorable. Di dying to subjugate, uh, dying in service to the state, that is honorable, you know? Uh, basically, it's a way to dupe human beings into throwing themselves into a meat grinder happily. It, the, the ide it's the ideological framework that gets someone to smile as the noose is being tied around their neck uh, to be sacrificed, you know? And... Yeah, it's basically a way to, um, if you think about how capitalism atomizes us uh, from each other, like breaks us down to the smallest possible unit, the, the nuclear family, um, you can think of fascism as breaking us down even farther and alienating us from life where we live only to die in service to the state. It, it's that sort of ideological framework that leads towards um, death, and that's why it's called a death cult. Um, and yeah, there, there, again, there, there are a lot of different death cults, but yes. It's kind of like the um, how the mythology of like manifest destiny motivated a lot of American colonialism. It's providing a mythol like a shared mythology on a sociological level to um, instill among the general population this inclination towards uh, needless sacrifice of themselves.
prime ministers having to do this. Look, they didn't have to do it on this level. I think a lot of Israelis, despite supporting Netanyahu, would argue it didn't have to be done like this. There are different ways to retaliate against Hamas. The irony is no Israeli government has done it like this before. This is the greatest death toll for Palestinians of any war in Israel's post-1948 history. So the fact that he did it like this was unique. I mean, look, the statistics speak for themselves, Piers. You know them. You've said them on this show. Yeah. The level of killing, the number of kids killed. Uh, you have one former UN official saying this is the highest kill rate in the world since Rwanda, right, of any mm. conflict since Rwanda. Do not tell me that the only response uh, to a brutal attack on civilians in Israel on October the 7th was to produce a conflict that had a kill rate equivalent to Rwanda's. Sorry, no, I don't accept that. Here's what I would say, playing devil's advocate, and you might think, I'm literally playing devil's advocate, but I'm going to play it anyway, which is, all that is true. The death toll is horrific. The percentage of children being killed is horrific. But I would say, as a caveat to this, that if you think about it from the Israeli perspective, you've got 35,000 Hamas uh, terrorists, and we'll come to whether you think they're terrorists or not in a moment, but you've got 35,000 Hamas soldiers, warriors, terrorists, whatever description you want to call them, depending on whose side you're on. And they are embedded amongst a civilian population where half that population is under 18. How else do you get rid of Hamas if you don't go about it in the blunt, brutal manner that Israel is doing? And if you do it the way they're doing it, how do you avoid the kind of casualty rate of people under 18, given that that's half the population? So three things very briefly. Number one, you do it by not deliberately targeting civilian targets and schools and hospitals and cemeteries and mosques and universities and churches. You don't have snipers shooting at hospitals. or. You, oh, oh you, do, you do it by adhering to the, the, the gener generally agreed upon rules of war and also by not targeting journalists and medical personnel <laughs> and schools. <laughs> like, come on. Christian women inside a church. That's how you avoid the casualties. Number two, I don't accept the premise of your question that this is the way to defeat Hamas. I think even if I'm an Israeli hawk, I criticize Netanyahu and say, this is not the way to defeat Hamas. This is actually absurd to think you can defeat Hamas in this way. We have countless episodes from history that show us this is not how you defeat a guerrilla movement, a resistance movement, a terror group, as you say, whatever words you want to use. In fact, you have Israeli generals saying this can't be done in this way. And number three, look, the reality is Hamas is a symptom of the problem. As long as you treat Hamas as the problem rather than as a symptom of the problem, you're never going to get rid of Hamas. Or if you do, by some fantasy means, get rid of Hamas, you'll just get another version of Hamas because now you've got tens of thousands of orphans. You've got people who've lost their kids, their spouses, their siblings. What, you think they're not going to fight back in the Years to come, you know, you think they're not going to take well, revenge? Well, that's how I it's feel. It's absolute I, madness to listen, believe. I feel, I feel the same way. I, then I we agree. I, so yeah, I think bro broadly speaking, I do because I think you can't kill the ideology, and in fact, all you will do is entrench yeah. the ideology. I think, and that's what I don't think Israel have thought through to a, a logical end game, which is you're not going to get rid of the thinking that inspired Hamas because a lot of people will have suffered such appalling grief with their close family. In but the again, way you Piers, described that they're, they're, they're going to want to get little, revenge. I think you're being a little too generous to the Israelis here, and and with the greatest respect, I think your questions reflect a little bit of a naivety about what Israel's doing here. Yeah. You're, you're starting from the premise that Israel is trying to defeat Hamas. I don't accept that premise. I don't believe that's what Israel is trying to do. What do you do think they're trying they to were, do? They wouldn't be doing it this way. They, the, they're doing. They're trying to do the thing they've been saying nonstop in their media. Like. Every single prominent member of Likud is talking about, like, turning Gaza into a parking lot. What, what do you, like, oh, oh, do we just not believe what they're saying? When you have members of, like, the, the Knesset talking about nuking the Gaza Strip, flattening it? When we have uh, members of the Knesset, members of Likud attending settler colonial conventions talking about how they're going to divvy up the Gaza Strip into settlements? Like, the plan... Again, this is... We're going back to... Earlier in the stream, when I was talking about how, like, you know, capitalism doesn't need to be done in 
in, in like secret behind closed doors meetings, capitalism is just done out in the open because like it's what everyone does. It is the modus operandi of our economy. And it, it, the same the same is true here with what Israel is doing in the Gaza Strip. I think they're trying to take back Gaza. I think they're trying to erase the resistance in Gaza. I think they're trying to get rid of the people from Gaza. I think this is their, you know, they've mowed the lawn, as they put it in previous wars. This time they're going in to erase the population. You know, they, you know there's a plausible genocide. Okay, but let me, okay, so, the so let me ask you that. Justice. If right. you listen, hold on, if you listen to Israeli officials, as you know, it's laid mm. out in the South African petition, they are very genocidal in their approach to flattening mm and burning down Gaza. It's not about destroying Hamas. And if it was about destroying Hamas, why has Netanyahu and Smotrich and others talked about how Hamas is an asset to Israel? Why do they say that openly, Piers? Well, he was clearly massively deluded, I think, Netanyahu, about uh, having anything to do with Hamas. I think that Netanyahu's plan was quite straightforward, which was to separate Hamas from the Palestinian Authority and create a split in the Palestinians yes. at an official level. And he thought that that was the best way of preserving security for Israel. He couldn't yep. have been more wrong. I mean, the, the thing I do want to ask you, you, I, I don't think you've called... So why, why should he stay in power? <laughs> Hamas terrorists. In fact, you've gone out of your way to call them fighters. Do you still think that? Or do you accept that what they did on October the 7th was an act of terrorism on a heinous so scale, and therefore you have to call them terrorists? So you're wrong, uh, uh, Piers. Uh, in my very first MSNBC monologue after October 7th, I referred to what happened on October 7th as terrorism. In fact, when I was 16 years old, I wrote a letter to the independent newspaper condemning Hamas bus bombings in the mid-1990s. Uh, so you're wrong on multiple levels. I don't expect you to know about my 16-year-old self, but clearly uh, my MSNBC output is all, for, is all there for anyone to see. So just to be clear, Look, just, to be clear just to be 7th, clear, you, you, it was an act of terrorism and Hamas are terrorists. Just to be clear, you do condemn Hamas. I... Okay. At this point, I feel like Piers Morgan is literally doing the... Is literally with his guests doing the family guy meme. You guys know which meme I'm talking about, right? Like... It's it's literally this. I feel like he doesn't ask his white guests whether they support Hamas. You know, like he didn't he didn't ask that of uh, Norman Finkelstein. Oh well, the the premise of this meme is just oh, if it's a white guy. He's not a terrorist. If he's a brown guy, he's a terrorist. Like that's the that's the joke going on there in the meme, essentially. Joke. That's your position. I think I think the Hamas fighters who went into... Well, and that, that's the thing, why so dankness. Like, intent is insanely hard to prove. Um, but that that is a legal distinction that will certainly be made through the course of time. But uh, I, uh, to me, it seems pl pretty obvious. Israel and killed civilians and kidnapped babies, certainly I would call them terrorists. Right. Just as I call Israeli soldiers who kidnap children and kill children terrorists. I use the terrorist label more freely because otherwise it's just a politicized, mm. empty phrase that we just apply to our enemies. What I would say, Piers, is that I find it a problem, and you, you know this, you've joked about all the memes about you, mm. this obsession with what we call Hamas, which is a question you pose, let's be honest, Piers, to most of your pro-Palestinian brown guests. He ain't wrong, though. He don't miss. You don't ask your Israeli or Jewish or pro-Israeli guests to condemn Israeli terrorism or Israeli war crimes at the start of an interview in the way you well, do. Well, no, I've been asked, directly, I've been asked directly whether I think Israel are terrorists, and I've said no. So I don't think they are. I think they had a right to defend themselves. The question is the That's scale. Not, that, wasn't, that wasn't the point I made, Piers. No, no, that but, wasn't no, the point I, I made. I, I said when you have Israeli guests no, no, hang on. on. I don't hold on, let me, no, let me finish on. my sentence. Let me finish my sentence. No, Medi, it's not your show. 
It's mine. I wanted to say that all, the whole interview, by the way. <laughs> so we got that out of the way. That's a joke. I'm joking. But the, the, the point I would make is, I, I think that I asked all the pro-Palestinian guests who've come on that question quite quickly, because I think it, it reveals a state of mind. If, like you, and I'm sorry, I, I didn't realise you had in that first piece on MSNBC done that. So I, I take back the suggestion you hadn't. And I'm glad that you have that you have called them that. I don't think you can call them anything else. So the moment you have a pro-Palestinian guest who wants to avoid calling what Hamas did an act of terrorism by terrorists, I think it's very revealing about their mindset. And I think it's the wrong mindset. Here's my problem with that. Why is that not applied to your Israeli guests? I would, I would, be, I would be fine, Piers, if you had Palestinian guests and you begin by asking them, do you condemn Hamas war crimes? Mm -hmm. Because what Hamas did on October 7th was a war crime. But then you should start with Israeli guests and pro-Israeli guests saying, do you condemn Israeli war crimes, which have been documented by the UN, mm -hmm. every human rights group on the planet. You don't. You had Naftali Bennett, the former Israeli prime minister, on a couple of weeks ago. I watched the interview. Mm -hmm. Your opening question was, how comfortable are you with the way Israel's prosecuting the war? Right. Bit of a softball. <laughs> yeah, literally you had the former prime minister of the country on. To start with, you didn't ask him to condemn Israeli terrorism, Israeli war crimes, Israeli genocide in Gaza. So a lot of people look at that and they say, I, they get your intention, mm. but it comes across as a bit of a racist double standard. Well, I, look, I don't think it's a racist double standard. And I think that nobody has given pro-Palestinian voices a bigger platform more consistently since October the 7th than me. Uh, and, I you think you, and if you go I back agree. and look you at have. those interviews, you know, I think that clips get taken. Oh, up. yeah, no, no. Um, Sophie, I, I agree with you. Yeah. The context and people assume they know what I've said. And often it's completely misleading. I've tried to be fair minded about it. People do ask me, do you. Guy on the right is a Chad. Guy on the right is Mehdi Hassan. And he was very likely let go from msnbc he he can't talk about the exact circumstances of him uh and msnbc parting ways but he was likely let go for being uh too loudly pro-palestinian you think israel are terrorists and i've said no i don't think they are but i have repeated why? well i have repeated why? because i think they have interest why because they were responding to an act of terrorism so heinous it demanded a massive military response. Wait, is it supposed to be pronounced heinous? I, I've never heard that before in my life. Heinous. Okay, no, he's just, he's just British. Okay. The question for me that's caused me a moral quandary is what is an acceptably... I, I don't know how he got... How he, how he made that word sound like 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 penis, but he 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 managed to do it. Proportionate level of response, and I don't know the answer, but I don't think you can call people responding to an act of terror on that scale. Wait, it, wait is it not even a British pronunciation? He's just saying it wrong. Terrorist for responding. What you can do is hold them to account. The problem, say, the problem if, is, if, is if you go to Gaza, if you go to Gaza, peers, and you talk to Palestinians, they will say that Hamas were responding. If we play the who started it game, we go back many decades. Well, when what we did need Israel, to have is a consistent When did Israel kill? Uh, what, uh, what we need to have is. Well, hang on. When did, to, Israel Israel kill when did Israel kill 1,200 Palestinians? When did Israel kill Palestinian civilians? When did they kill 800 Palestinian civilians in one few hour period? Right, in the way that Hamas killed but those Israelis. But that's not Israelis. the definition of terrorism, how many hours you do it in. I can mention many Israeli massacres going back to Sabra and Shatila, which they oversaw, going back to Kibia and Ariel Sharon, going back to Deir Yassin, where rape and violence happened. The I was wondering if he was going to mention the Deir Yassin. Um, yeah, the, the Deir Yassin massacre is like one of the most horrific uh, massacres that kickstarted the Nakba, which was uh, the expulsion of around 700,000 Palestinians from uh, the area that became Israel. And, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's, I, here, I'm just going to pull up the Wikipedia, and I know that, like, Wikipedia, whatever, not the best resource, but I think it has uh, the information density that I require at the moment. So basically, this happened before the formation of the State of Israel. Uh, the Deir Yassin massacre was done by uh, armed Jewish militias, uh, of which there were many at this time. Uh, they're, one of the largest was Lahi, and they were the group that prosecuted this massacre. 
And uh, in this event on April 9th, uh, they killed 107 Palestinian villagers, including the women and children. And uh, yeah, it's it's really not great. Uh, in in a, uh, a lot of this, uh, like I'm not I'm not going to go into the detail details of this, uh, but I did want to point this out. Th this part right here. Yeah. Ba basically, th this th these massacres, right, had such a profound and resonant effect throughout the entirety of the Middle East. Because again, you had 700,000 people expelled from their homes as a result of this particular massacre that lit literally for decades afterwards, the countries are in, in, in the region commemorated the massacre with with stamps like this was such a well-known event that may you could send mail with a symbol of the the attack on Deir Yassin yeah, j just just throwing that out there and uh, of course always worth mentioning that the uh, group that perpetrated the Deir Yassin massacre, well, he uh, had to be condemned by the state of Israel as a terrorist organization, called itself a terrorist organization at the time, and also uh, attempted to ally itself with Hitler and the Nazis, not once but twice, as well as Mussolini, and um, in order to fight the British and uh, the Palestinians. And uh, also even though it was officially declared a terrorist organization by the state of Israel, uh, some of its highest awards and honors, uh, some of the Israel's highest awards and honors are named after Lahi and uh, are also <laughs> like, you know, uh, a, a prominent members of Lahi went on to uh, hold prominent positions in in Israel, um, fr frankly. Yeah, cool, cool. just uh, a couple of them here. Yeah, me members of the Knesset. Uh, Yitzhak Shamir, literally the prime minister of Israel. You know, you you had you had some uh, you had you had a lot of a lot of a uh, lot of prominent members of Lahi going on to be uh, prominent prominent members of Israel's government. So, anyway, just worth pointing out that. Uh, We can go back, and I'm I'm just I'm just glad I'm glad to see somebody brought on these shows. You know, I know that Piers Morgan is a real piece of work, but it's nice, still nice to see him. And I I can't believe I'm saying this. Credit where credits due to Piers Morgan. At least he's bringing on people who can articulate the Palestinian plight. You know. Because it would be really easy for him to bring on, uh, you know, Twitter posters who are, like, easily prodded and poked into saying inflammatory stuff. It, it would be easy for him to scrape the bottom of the barrel, get, like, the Krasensteins on or something. But instead, he gets Mehdi Hassan on. And Mehdi Hassan is like really good at advocating for the Palestinian position. And I am, I, I, I like that. I, I don't know if it's arrogance on Piers Morgan's part or like actually a desire for somewhere in his heart to do journalism. I, I don't know which it is, but 
I, I like seeing Mehdi Hassan on here. The point is not to compare atrocities. The point, Piers, is to have a consistent moral principle, which is to say, if you kill civilians for a political cause, mm. you are a terrorist. On that basis, Hamas have committed acts of terror and Israel have committed acts of terror. I think that's only fair to say that. Yeah, listen, you're perfectly entitled to say it. Of course you are. Um, uh yeah, I, I, I think that Mehdi Hassan puts out, put, put together an excellent point here. Um, just real quick. It's time for the top of the hour ad break, everybody. What up? If you're enjoying or learning or getting anything out of this stream, please consider hitting the follow button on Twitch. Hit the subscribe button on YouTube. Like the YouTube stream. And please do consider dropping some subs or donos because those are what help me to not die. And I, I, I need... I need them to do things like pay rent and have health insurance and eat food. And uh, I would like to be able to continue doing all those things while also making content for you. you know, fine, fine folks. Um, I don't make a ton of money off of ad revenue. We, we're still a small bean uwu channel uh, over on YouTube. So please do consider dropping those subs and donos. They, they really do make a difference to me. Just, uh, I'm just pausing to take the temperature of the room here. Some people have accused the both sides have committed terrorism argument of being Zionist. Call that fucking bullshit. Now, th I think that there are a lot of people who feel more comfortable when, um, when the sides of a conflict are black and white and it's really, really hard for people to wrap their head around the idea that a conflict could exist where both sides are are bad maybe not the equal degrees but both sides are still committing bad act actions you know <sighs> it's true for five more subs i will do my makeup and be more beautiful on stream i'll do i'll do a makeup tutorial for you guys just subbed Paid subs. <laughs> Sorry. Mem I, on YouTube, it would be memberships. Also, hello, based vegan bonger. Welcome to the stream. Impossible. Extra possible. We don't live in a black and white world. We have colors. But sometimes living in a black and white world is pretty cool, like when you watch the movie Logan. People on the internet think they're just amazing sometimes. Yeah, and that's what differentiates me from most of the internet. I know I'm a piece of shit. Fascism is bad. <sighs> Jug on screen. <laughs> Jug sighted. Target acquired. Wanted to ask, I want to start streaming so can so I can be a piece of shit shit post and dismantle capitalism. Any tips? Um as far as tips go, like Uh, I mean, as far as tips go, like, make sure you're careful with, like, the people you build connections with. I know, I know it's a joke, but, like, 
for for real life to, you know just goes for anything you know um be careful about who you build connections with I, i've been burned so many times when it comes to like building bridges with other content creators that it it, it just at, at a certain point you, you got to be careful about who 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 you let in you know um I'm still not completely over the, the time like two years ago when I was just a tiny babby channel when um, like one of the close associates that I had got outed for being like a serial alleged rapist and like that that was crazy that that was that was shocking and I felt used and felt really really gross um that i had i had directed people towards uh his his channel yeah he uh he he wound up being accused by like 17 different women do streamers really start associating like that personally i mean like streamers will like do frequent collaborate uh, co collabs or like hang out post stream and stuff like that. That absolutely happens. I don't really do it with content creators anymore. Um, a after the experience I had, I, I would play. I played video games with him a lot. You know. Kevin Maxwell Smith, thank you for the $5 super chat. Will you tell that story about the channel's name again? I think it's like an old folk tale or something. <laughs> um, yeah, for sure. Basically, for those of you who are, who are wondering why is my channel called Riverboat Jack, um, I used to work at a Bible camp because I... Before I transitioned, I grew up in a deeply conservative evangelical house household, and I would go to this Christian Bible camp. And for two summers, I actually wound up working there and like mentoring kids and stuff. And this one one summer, the I think it was the second one I was there we were going around introducing ourselves and it gets to be my turn. I'm like, hello, my name. And we're going around introducing ourselves to like the council, the, the heads of the churches that kind of run the camp, you know, and it gets to be my turn. I'm like, hello, my name's Jack. And one of the, one of the, the old men on the council is like, just suddenly, Oh, we were going to name our son Jack, but then my old aunt, she told me, oh, don't you name him Jack. Everyone will think of Riverboat Jack the Gambler. And, like, the room just went qu quiet because we, we weren't sure what that meant. And uh, I, you know, we all, like, all, all of the, the staff and I were, like, a afterwards, like, what what the hell is Riverboat Jack? And, like, we... We got on the internet and looked it up and we're like, couldn't find anything about Riverboat Jack. There, there was no, there was no Riverboat Jack. There's no folklore Riverboat Jack story about some renegade Riverboat gambler. But for the rest of the summer um, and like maybe the year after, if it was the first year, uh, people would call me Riverboat Jack. Uh, the 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 other people at the camp, and uh, like a, a couple of times we'd have bonfires and someone would break out a guitar and like start making up f f the real folk songs of Riverboat Jack, like Riverboat Jack, Riverboat Jack, he'll take all your money, you know, like something like that. <sighs> about about my womanizing, money stealing, gamble cheating ways. That's what it's called, gamble cheating. Yeah, exactly. The classical music fan. There is no other Riverboat Jack. It's just me. 
Shiny Nix, you did just become a member. Thank you for becoming a member. I appreciate it. You you have the you have the heart next to your name. The the longer you are a member of the YouTube channel, the the more uh your your heart the heart next to your name evolves. Uh it, it's just like a fun little thing on YouTube that I, I enjoy. The Ballad of Riverboat Jack. Exactly. Here's to the promise. Exactly. You got it. Every time I hear Jack, I think of how wrestlers use it as an insult. Look here, Jack. This Sunday at Sacrifice. Yeah. And, uh... Oh, yeah. Uh... <laughs> and, like, my... my... My my name is Jack, and I just I just never changed it because I played Mass Effect two, and I really thought that the lady named Jack in Mass Effect two was really hot and sexy and powerful, and I really was just like, you know what, I'm kind I'm kind of okay with being called Jack. I think I think that I'll just own the name Jack as a lady, you know. Femshep forever. I haven't actually ever played through with Femshep. I, I need to rectify that. I'm still upset that we don't get to recruit Jack in Mass Effect 3. Riverboat Jack, Riverboat Jack, she's as sweet as honey. Riverboat Jack, Riverboat Jack, but beware her sting. Riverboat Jack, Riverboat Jack, don't take your eyes off. Riverboat Jack, Riverboat Jack, she's got an ace up her sleeve. <laughs> Riverboat Jack, Riverboat Jack, take my money musical note, musical note. <laughs> I love I love how Goonie texts the speeches. Method Yahoo, thank you for the five dollar dono. Riverboat Jack, Riverboat Jack, please take all my money. Riverboat Jack, Riverboat Jack, it's time to oil the engine. <laughs> Ooh, my name got all fancified now. Join me, friends. Let's have pretty names together and take down capitalism with Captain Riverboat Jack. Hell yeah! And if you guys, like, ser serious, if, if, if you guys want me to talk about the, uh, what I what I call the 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 vice for capitalism, I love I love talking about concrete steps we could take to transition our economy to democratic worker co-ops. I, I I love talking about that so much. <laughs> no no no, Sophie. We wrote a new folk song. We wrote that song together. I can't take credit for lyrics written by Lada Apples or Matt Tatiahu. What's an innocent but controversial take? Uh, innocent but controversial take. Mustard is a, is a bastard man that doesn't deserve to be on hot dogs. There we go. Innocent but controversial. Mustard, mustard is a condiment for bastards. What? Wait, what? Was this targeted? No? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, <laughs> oh, God. I, I, you know, I feel like I really, I really fulfilled that, uh, that, that question. Even honey mustard, even honey mustard. Calling the condiments police. The only time I've enjoyed mustard on anything is on like a, a good pork chop. Like a mustard, like in pork mix well, but like, I don't know. It's, it's just not a great condiment. Hapsley is known for spreading mustard facts by tips because they love mustard. <laughs> <laughs> I literally shitpost about mustard on Tofu Ghost stream. 
<laughs> That's such a weird specific thing. Amazing. <laughs> you should feel guilt for that take. Oh, God. What do you put on a soft pretzel? I've never had a soft pretzel. <laughs> I'm fine with being a bastard. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I, I, maybe I've had a soft pretzel once, but I, like, it's just not usually the thing I gravitate towards at, at like, events. So I, 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 as I sit here, I can't recall, you know, like Frodo on the slopes of Mount Doom. I can't recall the taste of soft pretzel. I'm sorry. Have you been made into a soft pretzel? No comment. <laughs> All right. Again, consider dropping those subs and donos. Let's go. Let's go back into this. But do you condemn hummus? No, hummus is delicious. Make mix some sriracha into that hummus. Get some baby carrots in that. Mm mm mm. Nah, I'm 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 going to town on that. I'm going to town on that hummus. At the Oscars on Sunday, Jonathan Glazer uh, won an award for Best International Film for The Zone of Interest, a movie about uh, the Holocaust. And uh, he's a director. He, he said this when he was on stage. Our film shows where dehumanization leads at its worst. It shaped all of our past and present. Right now, we stand here as men who refute their Jewishness and the Holocaust being hijacked by an occupation which has led to conflict for so many innocent people. Whether the victims of October the... <laughs> Whether the victims of October the 7th in Israel or the ongoing attack on Gaza, all the victims of this dehumanization, how do we resist? Now, that, that prompted a lot of reaction. Okay, but... Okay, I hadn't actually seen that clip before. Just real quick. Just real quick. Real quick. He's not saying that he refutes his own Jewishness. Like he said, we refute... Like, I, I refute... Basically, he's saying that he refutes his ethnic identity and the Holocaust being used as a pretext for attacking and dehumanizing the people of Gaza, right? Like, that that's what he's saying. He's not saying, like, he's giving up his Jewishness, you know? And I think a lot of people interpreted it as, from, from what I saw, because I, I didn't see the clip, but I did see a lot of the, the people talking about it. I think a lot of people thought that he's saying he's he's like giving up being Jewish or something. And that that isn't at all what he said. Who is using this point? Uh, Megan McCain, for one. Me Megan McCain was was big, was big on this. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, Palestinians didn't do the, the Holocaust? Well, because people are saying, oh, it's the biggest, the biggest attack on Jewish people since the Holocaust. You know, it's the, the people invoking, like, the, uh, we need to defend ourselves. We need to defend the state of Israel because of the Holocaust and thus justifying, like, the IDF response against, like, Palestinian civilians, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, pe people are using the event of the Holocaust or, or, like, the identity of being Jewish as, like, cudgels against the people of Palestine, uh, essentially. It, the, the phrasing of it is odd, and the delivery, because he's clearly nervous, is also odd. But, like, his, his intent is not, I give up my Jewishness. Like, he's not, he's not getting on stage to do that. Um, yeah, exactly. Also, it, important to point out, Hamas did not attack 
because they were Jewish. He, they they largely attacked for a variety of like very deep and long running geopolitical reasons, um, and also occupation. But uh, I I think at some point there like at some point I think there's some anti semitism like almost inevitably like woven in there, but you know who who could say what it would be had you know they not been occupied for the last like eighty years you know. As you'd imagine, New York uh, Post columnist John Potteret said on X, Jonathan Glazer, you can go bleep exactly shiny and stuff your Oscar up your bleep. To which you replied, cry more. Ben Shapiro wrote on X in Jonathan Glazer's zone of interest. You don't see one Jew. These are the best Jews, according to Glazer, the faceless victims screaming in the distance. Ironically, he's the villain, picking up awards from the bodies of these anonymous dead Jews while ignoring the living ones getting slaughtered in the Gaza envelope by genocidal murderers. Um, listen, you've seen the way that, that debate played out. Interestingly to me, before we get to what Glazer said, been really struck by the fact that throughout the entire Hollywood award season, be it movies, television, music, I don't think there's been a single statement by a big star about the Israel Hamas war, which is pretty well unprecedented for the biggest bunch of virtue signalers in the world. A, what do you read into that? And, and secondly, on Glazer's speech, was that the right time and place to say it? And what do you think of the reaction from prominent Jews to what he said? Well, let's work backwards. Uh, yes, it was the right time to say it. Why not? And I've been depressed to see that the award ceremony season has not seen anyone mention an ongoing genocide in the Middle East in which 12 and a half thousand children minimum have been killed in the space of a few months. So I'm happy he did it. I find the controversy to be uh, manufactured. I find it deeply dishonest. You have people like Meghan McCain uh, and others tweeting that he said he refutes his Jewishness. Just flat false. I'm glad you posted and played the whole clip here. Yeah, uh, exactly. Like. Exactly. I think a lot of people were maybe even just clipping the first part of that speech, like mid sentence, cutting him off because he he like pauses and we're like spreading around that clip as if like he was saying, you know, like al almost like he's doing like that scene from uh, The Office where Michael Scott declares bankruptcy, except it's him re refuting his Jewishness. because a lot of people have been very sneaky in posting a portion of his statement to make it sound like he was refuting his own Jewishness. What he said, as you, we all saw, is he refutes his Jewishness being hijacked by the occupation, which is how a lot of Jewish people, a lot of young Jewish... Also, again, Mehdi Hassan doesn't miss people, especially in the United States, feel. And that's why so many of us who are critics of Israel say, let us disentangle the political ideology of Zionism being pushed in the occupied territories from Judaism, one of the world's great religions, which is not responsible for the crimes of Benjamin Netanyahu or Bezal or Smotrich. So uh, I think he's been completely smeared. and I hope he sues some of these people. Uh, number two, in terms of Hollywood, mm. pff, for four years of Trump, Hollywood celebrities spoke out against fascism, yeah. authoritarianism, human rights abuses at the border. And now suddenly they've all lost their voices, which tells you a great deal about how this issue uh, is so censored in the US, to use a phrase that you like. Mm. Uh, it's not uncensored. We know that people in Hollywood, in the media, in politics, elsewhere, do feel a pressure not to speak out on this, do get worried about losing career opportunities. Uh, my good friend Mark Ruffalo was up for an Oscar yesterday. I was hoping he'd win because he's one of those bold folks who does speak about Gaza and Palestinians. I know he would have devoted his speech to it. Sadly, he lost to his fellow Marvel character, Robert Downey Jr. But look, it's a real problem that in Hollywood, there is so much censorship at a time when people talk about free speech and artists for free speech. And I'm glad Annie Lennox spoke out. I'm glad Jonathan uh, Glazer spoke out. I just wish more people were. Were you fired by MSNBC, cancelled by them, <laughs> because of what you said about the Israel Hamas war? As many people think you were. So just to clarify, I was not fired. Uh, I chose to quit after they cancelled my shows. They did cancel my shows, yeah. yes and I was disappointed, who wouldn't be, uh, to lose my two shows. Uh, you'd have to ask them why they canceled the shows. They never said it was about Israel-Palestine. People can speculate. Um, I then decided that, look, it's an election year. I've got a lot I want to say, uh, and I asked to leave. And they very graciously allowed me e to exit my contract. You know about cable news contracts, Piers. But could it, yeah, but could uh, it have been, maybe the reason I'm exit. asking is, it could you have been a... Well, Robert Downey Jr. didn't win an Oscar for being in the MCU. He, he won an Oscar for being in Oppenheimer. A victim of the very thing you're talking about, which is the censorship driven by big media companies 
in America, most of whose tentacles end up in Hollywood. Well, again, Mike B, like, people who are misinterpreting what he said are doing so willfully because it serves their narrative. You know, like, Ben Ben Shapiro isn't an honest actor. He is willfully uh, incentivized by mountains of money in order to, like, bend the truth as much as possible, you know, to create a new narrative. Like, his job as a propagandist is to do that, you know? I appreciate your questions, Piers, but you're going to have to ask MSNBC, get them on and grill them. Mm. I might do that. Um, you also said about Joe Biden that he was the most impressive president of my lifetime. That's from The Guardian uh, a calendar year ago. Do you stand by that? Yeah, uh, Robert Downey Jr. Uh, was a best supporting actor in uh, Oppenheimer. He, he played the bomb. Uh, so quick. Quick bit of caveat there. I was asked by the interviewer. <laughs> That's not a, a guy, yes, Medi. You know, how do you consider? No, no, no I, I will clarify. At the time I was asked, is he the great? I said, he's the best. I'm surprised he's the most impressive president of my lifetime. And then the next slide, which is in the piece, was, but then again, who's he up against? Ronald yeah. Reagan, George Bush Sr., Bill Clinton, George Bush Jr., Barack Obama, and Donald Trump. Not great competition. The bar is very low. But he exceeded that bar. I mean, Barack Obama's probably the only person who comes close. I think he's better than Obama in domestic policy. I was talking very much about his domestic record, and I stand by that. Biden's domestic record is the most impressive domestic record since LBJ. You look. That might sound, that might be difficult to hear, but it's kind of true, and that's really depressing. It, it's so it's so depressing, like. He he's he's messing up everything with his foreign policy. Ugh. Why isn't Palestine getting support from the U.S.? It, it is now, but like it, it's taken far too long for us to get to this point. <sighs> Look at the list, Piers. You know it. American Rescue Plan. Uh, Inflation Reduction Act, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Agreement, the Gun Control Legislation, the CHIPS Act, it's the true, Act, could go on and on. Record low unemployment. It's a great domestic I record. I can feel a but coming. Having Betty. said that, obviously, the but is October the 7th. Obviously, what he's done uh, on the foreign policy level in enabling Israel's genocide in Gaza, in arming Israel over 100 times, according to the Post, uh, since October the 7th, in giving a blank check to some of the worst fascists in Israel, that will be a stain on his record, on his career, on his presidency for many decades to come. And it's a real problem for a lot of people in this country who supported Biden up until October 7th. I meet many Biden voters. I meet Biden donors who say we cannot vote for him in November. And that is a real problem. So, yes, I stand by that headline from last year in domestic policy terms. But overall, I would never say that statement again because he's been so disappointing on the biggest moral issue of our time. I also yep. thought the withdrawal from Afghanistan was absolutely disgraceful. Again... Not Biden's fault. Like, it it was a terrible it was a terrible execution for sure. But like, Donald Trump literally released like thousands of members of the Taliban prior to uh, leaving office, a and also like set up an impossible timetable to withdraw from Afghanistan. A timetable that was already underway. There, there was no way for Biden to really, like, step in and, like, st stop that outside of, like, a full-on redeployment to Afghanistan. And, like, that that would also be terrible. Like, there, there was no good option. <sighs> and what that did to... Well, we disagree on that. I think it was one of the best things he did. But the way that it was carried out means that basically millions of Afghan women got thrown back to the Taliban walls. How can that be good for them? Unfortunately, there were no good options in Afghanistan. It was America's longest war. We had failed to quell terrorism or defeat the Taliban in those 20 years, as Barbara Lee warned back in 2001. 
and our presence there was not making things better. If in many ways it was making things worse. Look, the withdrawal was not great, shambolic in many ways, but I'm not sure there was a way to withdraw that wouldn't have been chaotic. If they'd given lots of notice, there probably would have been an increase in killings. And let's not forget, this was Donald Trump's plan that Biden executed. I'm glad he executed it. I'm glad that Donald Trump promised to pull out of Afghanistan, but Joe Biden did it. He ended America's longest war. He ended America's drone war. Uh, he did a lot of good things on foreign policy until October the 7th. But abandoning Afghan women to the Taliban wouldn't be categorized in my list of good things for an American president to do. There's zero evidence that our presence there would have helped Afghan women in the long term. In fact, Afghan women continued to be killed, maimed, uh, and just have their lives destroyed while America was on the ground in Afghanistan. The question you have to ask, Piers, is how long are we going to stay there? Another 100 years, 200 years? Sometimes you have to stay somewhere a long time to prevent the people who you displaced, coming back. The longest back. war in American history. Yeah, but Pierce. the Taliban seized power literally. Uh, uh, oh, oh, Pierce. oh, okay, Pierce. We were, we were just supposed to, what, annex Afghanistan? Fif 51st state, let's go, baby, Afghanistan. In days, and they immediately dragged those millions of women back to the Middle East. Like, like there, there are literally two options. You either, like, occupy temporarily, set up a new government, hold elections, make sure they can stand up on their own and leave, or you annex the territory. There, there's not really, like, another option here. Like, you can't, you can't just occupy a territory that is basically just a gigantic money sink that you're just pouring trillions of dollars into indefinitely. Hasn't Afghanistan never been conquered in human history? Uh, it, I mean, it, it, prob it probably has. It just, you know, it, it's kind of like modern day, uh, you, know, you know how like back in the 1800s, invading Russia was a really bad idea because of the, uh, the winter? Invading Afghanistan is just a bad idea. Uh, <laughs> idea. It's, 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 not, it's not great. <laughs> it's not a, not a great place to be if you're trying to uh, defeat an opponent. Well, ages. I mean, things it got immeasurably worse very, very quickly for Afghan women. You know, whether it was school or being I allowed agree. out and so on. So it, it, that, to me, is a calculation. If you're an American president, you've got to make that calculation. Does keeping a few thousand troops in a place like Afghanistan prevent the Taliban doing what they've inevitably done from the moment they got power again? I think the few thousand troops were not having an impact. If you look at the stats, Piers, uh, civilian casualties were up. Um, the, no, the level of drug production was up. The level of territory control by the Taliban was up. No serious military observer thinks that we were winning in Afghanistan. Yeah. Should the Democrats win the election in November if Joe Biden insists on being the candidate? I don't quite understand the question. Do you well, I was going to ask you if you winning? think he'll win, but the more interesting question is, should he win? I mean, is it good for America if a guy who is literally almost incapable now of speaking a sentence without making a gaffe or staying on his two feet, um, should he be the candidate? Would that be such a bad thing for America for the next five years that it should render the Democrat... Uh, Piers Morgan... Uh Joe Biden more often has the higher ground on you because you sit in your chair. Checkmate, atheists. Look at you, Piers Morgan, in your comfortable chair, sitting, unlike Biden when he stands at the podium. Checkmate, atheists. Democrats so, dis disqualified. So I'm going to agree with you from a different direction. I'm going to say that morally, he probably shouldn't be the candidate for president, given what's happened in Israel. A lot of people would prefer he stand aside, given the horrific record over the last few months and the way in which he has, as I say, written a blank check to Netanyahu while Netanyahu has carried out what the top court in the world. I think this is maybe the classiest way I've ever heard this question answered. And I think I'm going to steal it. I'm, I'm going to steal this. Like, morally, Joe Biden shouldn't be the candidate for U.S. president. Morally, shouldn't, shouldn't be president again. And yet, we're put between a rock and a hard place.
calls a plausible genocide. I think there is a lot of blood on his hands. And it would be better for Democrats, given you've seen the uncommitted vote, peers in Michigan, in yep. Minnesota, in some of these states. Uh, it could end up costing the Democrats the presidency. So strategically and morally, he probably should step aside. But he's not going to. He is the candidate, whether we like it or not. And the reality is the other candidate is Donald J. Trump, your mm. old friend. And if we're going to talk about mental unfitness, we can't start by talking about Biden. We have to talk about the most mentally unfit person ever to run for any office in the United States, and that is Donald J. Trump. Well, I mean, that, listen, that you're perfectly entitled to your view of him, uh, but the reality... <laughs> are, are you kidding? Robot person TV? Are, are you kidding? Are you kidding me over here? He's still talking about robot person TV. He is that after four I mean, years of Donald true. Trump's administration. Surely you don't disagree, Piers. Well, I'm going to explain Surely to you. Surely you don't disagree. I'm going to give you some facts about Donald Trump, which are, I think, quite startling given what Please. you've just said. One is that in, in 2020, oh my God, nearly 10 dude. million more Americans voted for Trump than first time around after looking at him as president for four years. That would suggest that a lot of Americans simply don't agree with you. Um, yeah, yeah, but it's also telling that millions more voted for Biden because of how bad of a job Trump did. Secondly, this time round, he's now got Muslim and Arab voters migrating away from the Democrats because of, of Joe Biden towards Donald Trump. And when it comes to the black vote in America, even more extraordinary, according to a New York Times Senate poll released at the beginning of this month, the support among black voters for Trump is now 23% which is a 19 percentage point increase since the same poll in October 2020. So for the guy who many like you would say is an appalling racist, it seems a lot of non-white people in America rather like what they see and want him back in the White House. Why? OK. So... Again, this is not an appeal to any of Donald Trump's qualities. It's merely like gesturing at people voting for him and being like, Ah, uh, yes. Clearly, he must be a good candidate. You see, people are voting for him. People voted for like a, like a, like a known child molester, peers in, in America. Like we, we have a history of voting for people who are absolutely terrible. I mean, you said you're going to deal with some facts. You didn't give me any facts about Trump. You gave me some facts about Trump supporters. Do I deny he has support? Of course not. I spent the last eight years documenting the crazy high levels of support for Trump. And in 2020, it was deeply shocking to see people voting for him after everything they'd seen over the previous four years. And it is very worrying about the trends in American society. And it is a fact that he's a racist. I won't just say, I think he's a racist. He's a racist by any definition of the term. And, you know, you said you're going to... He, he literally wouldn't rent apartments to like jewish people like he he wouldn't he didn't want to have black employees at his casinos like he's so racist that he wouldn't even employ black people if he had his way give me some facts about Trump. Let me give you some actual facts about Trump and mental fitness. Let's just talk factually. Donald Trump recently confused uh, Nancy Pelosi with Nikki Haley. He claimed he ran against Barack Obama in 2016. He ran against Hillary Clinton. Uh, he thought that we're about to enter World War II. We've actually had World War II. If we enter another World War, it'll be World War III. He thinks you can stop a hurricane with a nuclear weapon. He thinks you need ID to buy cereal. Uh, he thinks you can buy Greenland from Denmark. He thinks England and Great Britain are the same thing. He okay. To be fair, it might be possible to to buy Greenland from Denmark. That 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 is potentially feasible. We bought Alaska from Russia. Like it can happen. That 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 sort of thing could happen. Um yeah. He thinks that stealth bombers are literally invisible. He thinks that you can beat COVID by injecting disinfectant into your veins. The idea that this man should be allowed near a school board is absurd. The idea that he should be allowed near the White House again after everything we know about him? Mad I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know that like Denmark is terribly interested in selling Greenland to the United States. And I don't know that the people of Greenland who are trying to gain independence from Denmark are super interested in being annexed by the United States, but, you know. Oh, Mr. Anderson, that it, yes. Donald Trump, despite DNA evidence exonerating the Central Park Five, still wants them executed.
He's just a racist. Madness. And in so fact, how, I believe so you how? called him mad after January the 6th. And I agreed with that. I was Piers very Morgan, critical. Called him mad on I've January been very 6th. critical of him on many occasions uh, when I felt he deserved it. But I've also tried. What do we do with the Greenlandic Inuit? What? It, we're we're not we're not buying Greenland, so the the point is the point is moot. I, I I imagine though that if we we did buy them, we probably we we did buy like Greenland, we probably wouldn't be b bombing the the Inuit in in Greenland. Probably just like transfer like bureaucratic like uh, jobs over to the United States. Mr. Anderson, thank you for the five gifted memberships over on YouTube. I very, very much appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. Wasn't the Central Park five mid thirties? Yeah, they're they're all in like their thirties and forties now. Yeah, we we leave them alone. Tried Not to un I've also tried Not to enough. understand why so many Americans gravitate towards him, and I think what's stark at the moment, if you look at the the polling for Biden. His approval ratings are shockingly low, given who his opponent is likely yep. to be. Um, but also, particularly amongst Democrats, two thirds of Democrats don't think he should run again. And they cite his age and physical and mental incompetence yep. as the main reason. I mean, that's the reality. This is why I think for the Democrats, there's a really sharp click ticking clock coming here, isn't there? Where I do think if they persist in having yes. Biden as the nominee, which relies on him you know, standing down, which I don't think you'll do. Mr. Anderson, I appreciate your commitment to socialism in YouTube chat. I, you are one of the people who makes YouTube chat weirdly wholesome. Usually in all of the other streams I've seen, YouTube chat is like the, the degenerate chat where like people go to like throw slurs at a streamer. But for me, it's it's Twitch chat. It's very, it's very strange. It's reversed, and I think that's partly because of your work over in YouTube chat. I appreciate you. Thank you very much, King. And uh, also, thank you for the precious oil that allows me to keep uh, keep on trucking on. Non-binary superpowers. Is there a, a reason you just like posted the word cunt in my chat? Oh, were you doing a bit where you're like being the the Twitch chatter? Don't don't be the Twitch chatter. Don't 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 be that person. I like for real life. I I already get enough people in Twitch chat. Like luckily, a lot of the automated stuff kicks in and like prevents the messages from showing up. But like literally like every stream for like the last week and a half, there's there have been like just people spamming like faggot and it's getting caught in like the slur the the, the automated slur catcher. And it's uh it's it's not great. You know, I try and make I try and make the funny with it, but don't 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 just don't don't be that person. <laughs> God. Anyway, we need more comrades like Mr. Anderson, okay? God, Piers Morgan with his big, dumb face. I think that's how they lose. I think you put almost anybody else in there I mean, against Trump for all the reasons you've just cited, they'd have a much better chance. But you see, here's the problem, Eddie. That's Joe, Biden, necessarily... Joe Biden could not list the things you just listed and remember them himself. So, you know, when he tries to talk about Trump's that's, mental incompetence, he forgets halfway through what he's supposed to be saying. That's the problem. Is Biden gaff prone? Yes, he's been gaff prone for a while. Has it become worse? Clearly, he's old. No one's debating he's old. I think he's trying to lean in. Um, oh, what games do I stream? So I've been streaming uh, Death Stranding. I want to get back on that. Um, I got Helldivers 2 like a week or so ago, and I want to I wanna give that a shot. Haven't had time to play it yet. Um, I like to play like 4X games like Stellaris. Um, I also want to play Robocop Rogue City on stream at some point. Um, Pacific Drive has been particularly cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, Pseudo Regalia was also really neat. Uh, in the platformer Zelda with like a PS1 aesthetic. It's very, it's very cool. 
Uh, and highly recommend it, especially if you're like into furry stuff, because the the main character is a thick thighed like goat lady. Yeah, no no problem. But uh, I yeah the the last game I finished on stream was Baldur's Gate three, and that was amazing. Should we do a democracy on Friday? That could be really fun. I like Sly Cooper. Sly Cooper is great. And if you like Sly Cooper, you might really like uh, Pseudo Regalia. Here, I'll, I'll type. I'll type. Type the name of it in chat. There you go. Check that one out. Check that one out. Let's see here, and let's return to stream. Into his age now, if you look at some of the ads, you look at a State of the Union. He did a very good State of the Union, by the right? Way. Straw Hat Monty, Pseudo Regalia is really fun, and that Stranding also really fun. The way, with the exception of Gaza, yeah, it, it was a very bad, strong yeah. and energetic performance. I don't think anyone can deny that. The issue, of course, is we have a media that's singularly unable to cover Trump properly. That's one part of the problem, and of course, the age issue on the Biden front is a. I've never denied that's a problem. It is a problem, but the reality is, when you say the Democrats make him, he can't be made to stand out. He's winning primaries. It's a democratic process, and he's winning. If people want to run against him, they can. They didn't, and I'm not sure I agree with you when you say another Democrat could beat Trump. If you look at the polling, I think other Democrats. I think they have a better the vice chance. President, fair, fair, well, not according to the polls. The polls suggest people like uh, Vice President Harris lose much bigger to Trump. Oh, no, and let's not definitely forget, not Joe Kamala Biden Harris. The one, I'm not on. talking about... Yes, Kelsey Soloway. I will be playing uh, Dragon's Dogma 2. I'm so excited. I played so much Dragon Dragon's Dogma 1 and still never figured out how its marriage system worked. Still wound up marrying a lot of random NPCs. Uh, but yes, I'm very excited for Dragon's Dogma too. Uh -huh. Joe Biden is the one Democrat who's beaten Trump. He did mm. beat Trump. That's you true. mentioned uh, 10 million more votes for Trump. Mm. He beat Trump by over 8 million votes, I think mm. it was, if memory serves me correctly, mm. in 2020. In fact, Donald Trump has never won a popular vote against a Democrat. He lost to Hillary and he lost to Joe Biden. Talking of votes, um, at the Oscars, Barbie got flatlined by Oppenheimer. You said on yeah, MSNBC last summer, these are grown men losing their minds over a movie about a doll. What has happened to conservative movement? There was a time when conservatives talked about taxes, regulation, defense, foreign policy, but now it's just Barbie this, Dr. Zeus that, Bud Light, Mr. Potato Head. Uh, it's childish, ridiculous, pretty pathetic, actually. Um, now, I would take issue with that, because I'm not a conservative, but this whole culture war stuff, I think, is, I think it's very real. Well, no, I'll tell you what I would say. On the pendulum, historically, I've been slightly left to center. I was editor of the Daily Mirror here for 10 years in the UK, as you know, uh, having come from these fine shores. Come on. Um, it's a, 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 a Labour-supporting Labour Labour newspaper, on, right? Pierre. But what's happened is the woke left has you got so... You also edited the News of the World, one of yes. the most right-wing publications around. Actually, not under me. But we'll, we can... Because that was... If you may remember, that was an era <laughs> leading up to Blair, and we were, we were all part of the Blair. Uh, I, I feel like, weirdly, Mehdi Hassan's little jab there, like hit a little hit a little home uh, i feel like i feel like that that hit piers morgan that that hit him on in an unexpected spot uh uh success oh, yeah, story Tony Blair, that famous leftist yeah exactly but the the point i'm going to make though is that i think the woke left and i've heard bill maher say the same thing and others who consider themselves like me to have been liberals right is bill maher bill maher has never been a i i Maybe he's been a liberal. I, I don't know. But my impression of him is that he's always been a reactionary. He just happened to be a reactionary for, like, relatively mainstream ideas uh, that, that played well with the general public for a very long time. And uh, I, I guess now that we're not invading a Middle Eastern country anymore... Um, he, you know, he's he's now like, oh man, I'm I'm not a liberal anymore. Now I'm a conservative, <laughs> like that. That's that's my impression of Bill Maher in a nutshell. Is that the woke left got so insane that actually people like me and Bill Maher start to sound like we're vaguely conservative when I don't really have conservative ideology at all. Um, but what I would say is I'm definitely feel more at home with people slightly right of center than I ever will with the woke left. And this culture war stuff is driven and fueled by the woke. Yeah, like the two biggest red flags, I think, with with like anyone who's like a left-leaning person or a liberal 
is like being into Jimmy Dore or Bill Maher. You know, like those to me, those are like the biggest red flags possible. You know, folk left doing bonkers things. Like, for example, See, that's BS. Well, well, let me give you an example. BS. Let me give you an example. When you allow biological males, trans women. Ah, uh, yes. Here, there, there we go. Yes. Uh, I sometimes I do forget that Piers Morgan is virulently transphobic. Hell yeah, baby. Time to be reminded I'm not a real woman. Let's go. To compete against biological females at sport at elite level. Also, again, we've gone over these studies on stream over and over again. The, the studies don't show what Piers says they show. Like, if you look into the studies about trans women and participation in sports you'll you'll find that like trans women generally speaking after a year to two years on hrt regardless of age bracket wind up having athletic performance on par and within like acceptable probability ranges if you want to get really down into the nitty-gritty about it as like cis women you can you can find cis women who are you know, within the same probability range. You're a real, real woman to us and to reality. I, I didn't mean, like, I'm not a real woman. I just mean, like, I need to be reminded that these bigots, like, constantly in their... I live... People like me live in their heads rent-free constantly. And they need to... They, they feel this deep need to, like, belittle my womanhood when it's just as valid as, like, any other woman's. What you are doing is effectively licensing a form of cheating just as deadly and devastating to the integrity of women's sport as doping. There's no denying it, because if you have a, a biological physiology, so, you have a natural but that's, but that's advantage. It's unfair. But that's not what we're talking about. It is what I'm talking, what about. We're talking about. I'm actually real women. I am all women. I am femininity. I'm sorry, I'm not going to let you... No, 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 because no, you didn't. You just quoted me talking about Bud Light and all the nonsense. If you want to say there's a debate to be had about transgender rights, about bathroom issues, about sports, about where we go, that's a legitimate debate. I've mm. never said you can't have a legitimate debate. Do you about agree that. is wrong? What I am saying, though, is when... Hold, hold on. What, hold on. What I am saying, though... Listen, what I am saying, Piers, is that when you have Fox and when you have your old, you know... When you have what? Listen, what I am saying, Piers, is that when you have Fox... I'm sorry, I'm all out of those. And when you have your old, you know, your, 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 your man Rupert Murdoch and his minions pushing... They really... <laughs> Mehdi Hassan has gone mad uh, after, uh, after being let go from MSNBC. And he's just dropping the F-bomb all over the place. These fake culture wars to divide up America. But they're not fake culture wars. We have millions of Americans. They're not. Well, they they're, are, Piers. They're not. Millions they're of actually, Hold on, let me finish the sentence. They're actually very me, real. Can I finish the sentence? Sure. Well, let me finish the sentence. I'll tell you why they're not. You should answer when my question. When millions of Americans are living... Oh, I am, if you let me finish a sentence. Millions of Americans are, are living paycheck. Is there really a debate to be had, Collaborac? I, I think really just the, the, the question is more logistical than... <laughs> than anything else back to paycheck the climate crisis is destroying the planet mm. and you think we should spend loads of hours on fox on cable debating the green m m's boots do you think that's a legitimate time consuming uh, debate yeah to i thought that was a, a, scandal a scandalous state of affairs actually wow but more importantly wow, people are starving people are losing their jobs you, people don't have health care the if climate you, is on fire Freddy. If you, were if you were interviewing yourself, the green which, M &M is proper on. journalism. If you were interviewing yourself, what you would now be saying is, "Many a son, you cause. have single-handedly refused to answer the original question, which is, do you no, support?" You didn't. You said the woke left. You said do the you, woke left. Let me ask You're you the question the again, because you obviously didn't hear me. Would you do you support trans women competing in women's sport? Do I support trans women? Yes, under the under the under the correct set of rules. Yes, I do, and I'm not an expert on this subject. What rule? My could, understanding is what rule that could people possibly like yourself, be correct? Because uh, anywhere between a year and two years on HRT, and then then you can join, unless you're talking about the sanctity of like s sports for for children, in which case like you can impose similar rules, but obviously with a bit more loosey goosiness.
uh, in in the school system. Like you can, yeah. Like I, I support. Honestly, that's Kelsey solo way. That's the play. That's the play Matty Hassan should should make here. He should just be like, I support the science, Pierce. And the science indicates that trans women and cis women can equitably compete in sport under under certain sets of circumstances. You know, depending on HRT and and hormone blockers and all that stuff. Like, it it's pretty it's pretty simple to me what the what the rebuttal should be. And I guess this is maybe catching Mehdi Hassan a bit flat-footed here. Uh, like I don't think he's wrong. I think he's I think he's going to wind up on the right side of this issue, but like this kind of, th- this question obviously came out of nowhere in like the 11th hour of this debate. Because I believe that the sports bodies who investigate this stuff actually look at, for example, in swimming, what the levels are, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. I'm not an expert on this, but I will tell you this. If you want to have a debate about transgender rights, that's fine. You should have a transgender mm. guest on to discuss it. It's not I my have. expertise, but let me just be very clear. That's not what you asked. You started the question saying you and Bill Maher are not, le- you're all lefties mm. who became conservative. You're not, let's be honest. Bill Maher is an old white guy who has a history of bigotry. He was never on the left. And therefore, I, I do see a lot of old white I, again, I I think I think he's correct. I I think that Bill Maher has always been a reactionary. It's just that he happened to conveniently align in his reactionary tendencies to uh to to mainstream where where the body politic was at the time. Men who are very uncomfortable with people of color and people who don't look exactly off- Crystal Hazer, which is why like again when it comes to rules for like high school it gets a little bit more complicated because like there's hormones now involved but i think like if you've been on hormone blockers there's no reason for you to not be able to participate in the sport of your choosing um and i i think that also again it, it would have to be like uh, if you if you've been going through puberty for like a year or something you you got to be on a year of hrt before you can participate or, or some something along those lines, um, which, by the way, have been the guidelines historically. Like it, it's usually the scientific studies come down on like one to two years, and it, it does vary for like trans folks. Um, for like high school sports, I think one year is probably just fine. For like professional level sports, probably err on the side of like two years, but like. that that's that's the thing like I, you you can you can follow the science and it takes you to about that point I sound like them asking for rights asking for space asking for freedom and that is the backlash if you really cared about free speech you would be going on about the silencing of pro-palestinian speech on campus the banning of books in florida not the green m&m or dr seuss or all these fox murdoch generated fake controversies but they're not fox murdoch generated controversies they're generated by yes the they are no, no. they literally start well and that's the thing uh spooncer i'm also open to the idea of like just changing the way we uh, like separate sports and like using weight class uh as like a point of comparison um not point of comparison uh but like a a way of like segregating like sports into different divisions i i think i think we could maybe do that um but i don't know that that applies necessarily to all sports like i don't know i i like for boxing i know that's like appropriate but i don't know if like It's appropriate for all of the things, you know. I'll leave it up to the sports scientists. Not on Fox. No, they literally no, start they on Fox. Page. You no. haven't been living here for the they, last few years. I'm no, telling no. you, I've, I'll send I've you a long list in America for 20 they years. They, they start with somebody on the woke. Well, left I'll give doing... you a long list after well, the show's on. over. I would say they start with somebody on the woke left doing something nuts and playing right into the hands. Yes, yeah, some random person who's a- amplified right. by Fox. Meanwhile, Ron DeSantis gets a pass from you and other journalists for bringing in authoritarian rules in Florida. But if people you're really are here, worried okay. about freedom, many, many. focus on the fascists who are getting rid of our freedom. Right, but it's I think simple. it's... I don't think focus it's, on random college I think, with a placard I think, that you don't hang like. Hang on. I think the wokery is a form of fascism. I've said this many times. It's about silencing it's, people it's, that don't... That's... That's, that's stupid. That's that's as stupid as saying like that 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 is on the level of like uh 
you know, like a, a, a small child telling you that, like, oh, I, I don't get the cookie. I don't kick, get the cookie. You're a fascist. Like what? That that's that's the level we're talking here. Like this is crazy. Oh yeah, uh, some people were saying that the Barbie that that uh, <laughs> that Oppenheimer was a bit sexist. So uh, that's fascism, actually. That's insane, dog. That is actually insane. Also, just want to say, uh, Mr. Anderson, thank you for the $50 super chat. I very, very much appreciate that. Today was profit sharing day, and I've got some dues to pay. Your coverage of the UAW strike was really good and quite educational, actually. Mr. Anderson, I'm glad that you appreciated it, and uh, I, I certainly appreciate the profit sharing. Um, and uh, I, I also I also just appreciate the UAW. Uh, they've you know Sean Fain and the the union organizers have been you know I, I've mentioned this before on stream but like they've been organizing with other unions to set up contract renewal on the same timeline and I think that is so cool I think that is so cool um a lot of you might have heard of like the TikTok attempt to organize a general strike and like the the rea the reality is you're not going to be able to just be like, hey, everybody, uh, uh, you know, uh, March 12th, Mar March 15th, we're doing a general strike. Like, no, you actually have to, like, have negotiations in place. You have to have the support structure. You have to have the bureaucracy to do it. And the UAW, in, in my mind, is kind of leading the charge towards... Uh, building a coalition of unions that would enable something like a general strike to happen. And I, for one, am really excited about those possibilities. My son is in wrestling and his school has quite a few girls on their team. They wrestle by weight class. They wrestle whoever's in their class. They're amazing to watch really, even though wrestling is hard to watch as a mom. Yeah, I, 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 I imagine that would be really difficult. Uh, may maybe better to watch than football, uh, for for like youth. But I, I feel that solidarity forever, Mister Anderson. I I deeply and truly appreciate uh you holding down the fort in YouTube chat. Let's uh let's finish this up, huh? I agree with you. BS. It's about in the trans debate. If all the trans debate was about was a was a right to fairness and equality for trans people, I'm a fully signed up you think, member. Hold, hold on, hold on. I just I want to be clear here. I want to be clear here. You think you? I, I'm going to be clear. I, as I said, I believe that sh we should be able to have a debate about transgender rights, mm. about access, about safe spaces. I believe that. But are you suggesting that transgender people, one of the most demonized minorities facing high rates of violence, are fascists, are a fascist threat to America no. at a time when your friend Donald Trump is an actual fascist? No, like, no. I'm going to be a dictator. You're misquoting me. Criticizing Trump no, you're misquoting me. I said, I said that when the woke left behave like fascists, which I think they do regularly, because they silence any debate. For example, do you think Donald Trump behaves for like example, a fascist, Piers? Well, we're talking about the woke left Do you left think Donald now. Trump behaves like a fascist? We've already talked about Donald Why? Trump. Why? Why do you not talk about Donald Trump's fascist? I have Oh, the the classic classical music fan. No, Israel's is absolutely fascist. Benjamin Netanyahu attempted to dissolve uh, judicial review of uh, laws, uh, effective in a, in such a way that would effectively make him a dictator. Like the the Likud coalition is absolutely fascist. I talked no, about didn't. Donald you Trump. You told me how popular he is. I talked you about You didn't him. condemn him. I talked I about him. I noticed you didn't condemn I've him. I've condemned many things Donald Trump's done. In fact, you cited one of them earlier. His fascism? I, the, okay, I, Mediasan has done very, very well up until this point. I guess my main criticism here is just like, I, I feel like talking to Piers Morgan and pretending as if Piers Morgan was going to at any point ever condemn C condemn that i i i think is it, it's not necessarily like a great optical move i think he's been doing really really good throughout the rest of this but uh the trying to do a gotcha about like you you didn't call out these people it comes it comes across i i think vibes wise uh as a bit as a bit weak 
which is not how you want to be ending this interview, you know? Yeah, it, it's a it's a bit of like he's losing his cool, which to be fair is is prodigious. He's he's been going for almost an hour with this guy, um, needling him. But he's he's also losing his cool over, like, petty optical considerations. Oh, I didn't know Likud is the is the descendant organization of Irgun. Okay. That makes a lot of sense, actually. You cited one of them earlier. I it's don't fascism. Think, I don't think... Yeah, yeah, no. I, the goal throughout the conversation is to point out Pierce's hypocrisy to the viewers. I just don't think that this is necessarily the way to do that to the viewers, you know? Um, I, don't, I don't necessarily think that his viewers would be amenable to this. But yeah... That is, uh, that is how you behave in debates like this. I don't think Trump fascism. is a fascist. No, no, no. Wow, but the left transgender activists are fascists. Trump, but actually, Trump who says I'm going to be dictator for I'm a day, I'm talking about why the woke left, when the woke left wants to suppress free speech, they behave like fascists. When they want everyone to conform to their narrow worldview, and when they want to shout down and silence and suppress debate about, for example, trans athletes competing in women's sports. Who's being? I, I feel, I feel like at a certain point here like the play is less you didn't condemn these people and the play is more peers you're saying that it that it's fascist for woke people to uh to criticize people and i feel like at that point you need to make an appeal to like an actual historical definition of of fascism you know like at, at that point you need to be like, you need to call Pierce on that BS. I think that would have been much more effective. But that, that's my, that's my, you know, opinion. Banning yeah. books in I America. Think, Pierce, I think the woke left is a form the Republican of fascism. Party. I think that's a form of fascism. Who's been banning books in America, Piers? The woke left or the Republican Party? Actually, historically, both. No, right now, who is banning books across America, according to every I human think a lot of the books, and civil liberties? I think a lot of the is it the books, Republican I've... Party or the woke left? Well, it comes, but it, this comes down to another issue, which is whether you think that children you can't in school... answer a simple question. I, I'm, which I can't answer, which group of people are banning books? I'm answering books. a question. I think that when it comes to kids at school, I'm a father of four kids. I actually don't want them exposed to, to graphic stuff in books at school. I don't. And nor do I want them exposed to critical race theory or any of these other things that you think are the, the purview of Fox... So, and the right no, wing. I think I'm books not, about MLK right and Rosa wing, Parks parent, should be banned. As a parent, I think it's fascism. I, as a parent, I think it's fascism I don't think to ban right. books about MLK and Rosa Parks. Sorry? I think we should be able to have books about MLK and Rosa Parks not banned. Absolutely. I think it's pretty fascist to ban Absolutely. books but about kids, Rosa Parks but and Martin But kids should King. not have critical race theory preached at them when they're young. I don't agree with it. Well, there's, there's no critical race theory in American schools, so... You know. Oh, well, there is, and you know there is. No, there isn't. You're Maybe. wrong. You're wrong. Critical race theory is not taught in K through 12 schools in America. You know this. As you it's well a know, university law. As you well course. know, there are many teachers in American schools who are teaching critical race theory. Oh my God! It it, it descended into the stupidest sludge, for the stupidest mind holes. And that's been a big problem <sighs> in American it. society. They're also teaching. You'd have to point to me. I yeah, it, it's been it's been such a big problem problem in American society that like Piers Morgan can't like name one single thing that critical race theory is harming in America. Piers, any time. I'm on I'm on I'm on Twitter. You follow me. Please <laughs> post to me which teacher is post teaching critical race theory. I'll be I'll, I'll be do happy that. To see that. I'll do that after this interview. Uh, Medi, I could talk to you for a long time. Uh, I'm. Great to see you back on the airwaves. Great to see you uncensored, living up to the, the name on the tin. I wish you all the best with your new media empire. And come back soon. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much. It's called Zateo, and I appreciate the opportunity, Piers. Cheers, Manny. All the best. What, uh, what actually is CRT? Critical race theory is a legal is a legal framework through which to analyze the United States legal system. Um, in, in a nutshell, essentially, like, let me uh, make sure I'm not just pulling stuff out of my ass.
Oh, yeah, ba basically, okay. Yeah, it, it's basically the idea that, like, race um, and, like, the racial structures of society have been upheld by legal distinctions and definitions for hundreds of years, and that the legacy of that framework to some extent still exists within our legal system. And thus, we need to be able to look at our legal system with a critical eye in regards to race and, like, have an analytical framework through which to understand the historical root of different, like, uh, different laws, different uh, legal systems on the local, state, and national level. Um, yeah, like... To, to like, this is a very small-scale example, but, like, uh, the fact that in Minnesota there are still places, there are still neighborhoods, and I know this for a fact because people I know have gone into their housing agreements when they move into their houses um, that say it cannot be sold to, like, a Hispanic or black person. Now, none of the th this law is not enforced anymore, but it was still in like the paperwork they they had to sign to get their house. They they got a lawyer to take it out, but like that stuff still exists and is embedded in our legal codes, and like that was um that was for just like a I, I think like a county wide maybe like a city wide thing. Um, so these things still exist and like having the analytical framework through which to view them helps a lot to like better understand our legal codes and legal system. And when conservatives are talking about critical race theory, they make it overly broad as if like this legal analytical framework that is taught at law school to prospective lawyers is being taught to kindergartners when in reality what happens when you teach like that type of analytical framework to like a kindergartner it's it's basically like ma making sure there are picture books in in the classroom that have like black and brown people in them you know so that like kids all feel valued instead of just relying on like all of the books that like I don't know, your your white mom and dad read to you growing up uh, that might not have had any black people in them. So it's it's just keeping the, the idea that basically conservatives are just mad at the idea that like educators equally value students regardless of, of race or and also also while keeping in mind like the specific struggles of different groups of children what they might have based on their race you know it's uh like and that isn't critical race theory but that's what the right objects to as critical race theory when they talk about it in k through 12 schools so i i hope that helped <laughs> hope that helped